Uh, good morning. Um, before we get started with our ground rounds, I'm going to just uh, mention our uh, June uh, kudos. So uh, kudos for Adam San Georgian. I guess there's no there's there's no comment on there. <laughs> he did a good job. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't read down far enough. Uh, patient wants to recognize the outstanding care from Dr. San Georgian, who saw her in the ED, but whose name she could not remember at the time. But it turned out to be Adam. And also kudos uh, number two for Adam San Georgian. For another patient wants to recognize uh, the doctor who saw him um, by saying the doctor did a great job. So where's Adam? The, the Adam San Georgian show. Oh, it's right here. Uh, yeah, it must be working. Okay, so uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce one of our former residents, and uh, I, uh, it, it seems like just yesterday, Greg, that you were here. It's hard to believe that it's been a few years since you were gone, but uh, uh, Greg Nicandri is, uh, well, he had a pretty live arm still when he was here as a resident, but they say he was a pretty good quarterback back in uh, back in his day but he went to Penn State and then uh, University of Virginia for medical school came out here and uh, now he's working at the University of Rochester and he's got a really big interest in teaching how to train residents in orthopedic skills so many of the residents who have used these little fast workstations well that's Greg so he's going to tell us uh, about a lot of better ways to help teach people how to gain skills. So it's really my pleasure to uh, introduce Greg McCandry for our grand round speaker today. Welcome. So thanks, Trey. Uh, it's a little surreal being back here. The last time I was doing grand rounds, I was a chief resident talking about clavicle fractures, and that was about uh, seven years ago. Um, the topic of today's uh, talk is resident uh, orthopedic education. And the first thing that I want to do uh, is just to say thank you to all of my mentors here at Harborview and the University of Washington uh, from, the, from the bottom of my heart. You know, the commitment and effort that you guys put into my education has made me the doctor that I am and allowed me to achieve my dreams and goals of becoming an orthopedic surgeon. And a lot of what you guys do kind of goes under-recognized, but I want to say that, you know, not a day goes by that I don't hear the voice of David Bray or Dr. Chansky or Dr. Green or Dr. Matson in the back of my head uh, when I'm in the OR. And that'll always be a part of me and something that I took from here and that I really, really cherish. So. Uh, thank you guys very much for what you gave to me and for this opportunity to come talk uh, today. I don't have any real disclosures. Uh, I don't have any financial relationships. Uh, I do serve on the uh, AANA FAST committee and the AOS committee on uh, virtual reality simulation, and those things are somewhat relevant to this talk today. So I think we're all very acutely aware, uh, both as teachers and as residents, of the changing uh, educational landscape within medicine. You know, this all started with the Institute of Medicine report uh, right around 2000, uh, where they started focusing kind of the media and the public on patient safety and medical errors. And that's what led to the formation of the 80 hour work week, which, you know, still sounds like a lot of time to put in a lot of work. Uh, but it really changed the way we were able to educate our residents. Um, there is an increased focus now on efficiency and volume, both from a healthcare economic standpoint as well as a patient safety standpoint. So, you know, we know that surgeons who do a higher volume of a particular procedure get better outcomes. Institutions kind of follow that same pattern. Um, and then, you know, there's been an explosion in technology allowing us to do really big surgery through extremely small incisions. And that's great for our patients, but it also has increased the steepness of the learning curve for our residents. You're having to do things that are way more complex than even I was learning in my residency and in the same amount of time. 
And so this has really you know, presented some significant challenges to residency programs as we look at how do we you know, best educate our residents in this, in this era. Um, you know, if you're doing a really technically challenging case, you may have residents who are doing a lot more observing. And we know, you know, Tiger Woods didn't get to be Tiger Woods and hit the golf ball the way he does by watching Jack Nicholas hit the golf ball on TV. He spent hours and hours and hours on the driving range practicing and honing his skills and then, you know, playing on the tour and playing a lot of competitive golf. And residency, you know, needs to be the same way. You need to be able to practice your skills to perfection. You need to be on the range where you can actually make mistakes and learn to correct those mistakes. So that's, you know, the simulation lab. And then you need to be in the operating room with a chance to operate autonomously to, you know, see where you've been able to uh, move ahead in your, in your skills. And so there's been a lot of focus, you know, the answer for a lot of residency programs has been to push you know, operating out of the operating room and to really learn those skills in the, in the simulation lab. I think that there is definitely a lot of value in that, and that is one component to how we answer this problem, but it's not the be-all, end-all. I think the OR is and always will be the place where residents are going to receive their most valuable. I think nothing really epitomizes that problem that we're facing in resident education than, than this slide. So these are our numbers at the University of Rochester. I'm sure that they mimic uh, probably numbers that you guys see and numbers that are, are nationally. So there's been a shift in orthopedics really over the last 10 years of where we do surgery. So when I first started working at the University of Rochester, we were doing about 40% of our surgeries at the Ambulatory Surgery Center and about 60% uh, in the inpatient setting. That's completely flipped now. We're doing the majority of our surgeries in the ambulatory surgery center and less surgeries now in the hospital. And that environment in the ambulatory surgery center may not be as conducive to resident education. You know, there's a, a significant push to do a high volume of cases, to be very efficient, um, low turnover times, not much time to talk between cases about, you know, your plan for the following procedure, um, a little bit less uh, interaction uh, with the residents between cases. and. You know, my question was, well, how does this affect what the residents actually get to do? We didn't know the answer, so we decided to, to study it. So I had a college student who was, uh, you know, very interested in orthopedics and worked with me for an entire summer, observing one resident each day at the ambulatory surgery center with an iPad, and he clocked exactly what they did. Specifically, was looking at how much time was the resident actually the primary surgeon. We, uh, we defined primary surgeon as the resident had his hands on the instrument or was directing the operation. At that time, you started the clock for recording time for the resident. The clock stopped only when there was a clear transfer of the direction of the case to the attending faculty. And if there was anything that was not clear, uh, where it was kind of nebulous who was controlling, the benefit of the doubt was given to the resident because we wanted to increase our error you know, on the side of increasing the amount of time the resident was the primary surgeon. And so what did we find? Basically, the residents at our ambulatory surgery center operate for eight hours. They're there for eight hours. They're there for an eight-hour day. They spend 90 minutes operating. So that means in, in an operative day where you are supposed to be getting and practicing and honing your surgical skills in the OR, you've got about 90 minutes of actual hands-on instruments where you're, where you're doing it. I found that pretty, pretty shocking, um, and uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. We found other things that were you know, kind of more to be expected. So if you look at you know, percent of time spent operating, there was this you know, concept of graduated responsibility as the residents progressed through the program. They were performing more of the cases. And residents who were participating in open cases were allowed to do more or were primary surgeon more often than in arthroscopic cases. So, you know, the first conclusion that's easy to jump to is, well, those guys at the University of Rochester, they don't care about education. They just don't let their residents operate. All they care about is, you know, making money and doing cases and kind of getting things done. And, you know, we put in a questionnaire to assess the barriers to resident participation in the, case, uh, in the cases. And we found that that's not the case. So all residents and attendings to a T basically felt that their level of participation uh, in the case was appropriate or very appropriate. Nobody said, man, I could have done that whole thing and the attending didn't let me touch the scope at all. Uh, and the primary barriers to participation that were identified on both sides were resident experience 
in case complexity. So what that means is we've got this you know, problem in any live situation. You've got a patient with a complex issue. You've got a resident who is on a rotation. If they're an R2, they might not have the skill set yet to be capable of operating on that patient. Um, and and you know, therein kind of lies the problem with the OR experience. So this study really kind of taught me that resident hands-on surgical experience is an extremely valuable and limited commodity. We all know that it's important, and that's how our residents are going to get the surgical skills and, and that you know, group of tools and bag of tricks necessary to, to treat their patients. But I think we've got to do a better job at how we get them those tools. So if you extrapolate this over an entire residency, you know, this is just some you know, basic uh, extrapolation looking at, okay, they operate for 90 minutes a day, say they operate four hours a day, uh, that means they're getting about 294 hours a year or 1,470 hours per residency. And that's saying that you're doing it, you know, four days a week. That's not a whole lot of hands-on time. And, you know, I think everybody's familiar with the 10,000 hours concept to expertise. I'm not saying that we really need to train our residents to expertise. You have to train them to some level of competency. How many hours does it take to achieve that competency? I'm not sure. But if you look at, you know, the airline industry and when they, you know, say a pilot can fly a commercial jetliner, they basically have to have at least 2,500 hours logged with somebody, uh, you know, in, in the plane with them before they're allowed to, uh, you know, fly fly solo. And that's just for flying a plane. I mean, there's, you know, there are things that come up while you're flying a plane, but that's different than learning how to do hand surgery, knee arthroscopy, putting together a complex fracture, doing knee replacement. I mean, you guys are expected to have a baseline competency in an extremely broad range of, of surgical skills. So, Unfortunately, I think that this era of limited uh, surgical opportunity for residents is likely to continue. And I think if we don't rigorously evaluate what we're doing, it's going to be increasingly difficult for residency programs to ensure that our graduates uh, are competent for independent practice. And so, you know, I've got kind of a strategy for how we can kind of work or change our ed educational paradigm to kind of fit into this environment. So uh, first of all, I think we need to try to increase opportunities for residents to practice their skills. So if you're getting 90 minutes a day in an eight hour or 12 hour day, you know, think about what would happen if you were able to give them another 90 minutes. You've just doubled their residency. They've just got double the amount of surgical skills than what they had before. And I think there's enough fat within the residency program and within the workday that you can kind of trim it and actually achieve that, that goal. So you need to look at the resident workday, eliminate waste and redundancy, and improve kind of their systems. Uh, and I think that you'll see that that has a significant effect on improving both patient care as well as the quality of the resident education and their surgical skills. I think that, you know, a great man once said that you can't change what you don't measure. And so we need to have ways of longitudinally and objectively assessing that final outcome. If our final outcome is competency, we need to know how to measure it. It needs to be a measurable so that we can kind of work towards that goal. And that'll let us both ensure that the residents that we're graduating are competent, but it'll also allow us to rigorously evaluate our curriculum and make changes. So if our curriculum is not working to improve competency, we'll see it, we can change and make a better curriculum. And then to give folks those extra hours and to make uh, and allow them to establish kind of a, a uniform baseline of fundamental skills, I think a really strong program uh, augmented with simulation uh, is important. That's the way, you know, everybody may not see uh, really complex periacetabular, you know, acetabular fracture, something like that, or be able to do a whole lot on their rotation. You can standardize at least what everybody does in the lab. So they've seen the instruments, they've worked through the thought processes and uh, acquired those skills. And it allows us to kind of increase the value of that precious OR time. So, you know, I used to, when I first started, residents would show up in my OR holding the scope upside down not knowing how to move the light source or manipulate. I'm sure you guys have all experienced the residents who can't hold a saw, or when you started, you just didn't know how to hold the saw or the drill or not plunge. These are not things that need to be taught in the operating room on an anesthetized patient. You can learn all of those skills outside of the operating room and become a lot better so that when you do go to the operating room, 
you're more useful to that patient, you're more useful to your attending, and that time is you know, more well spent. So you know, the first con concept is eliminating waste and redundancy. In order to do that, you've got to identify it, and there's really no studies out there uh, to do that. So we did a small study last year basically looking at it, well, what do our residents do all day? Uh, this was another you know, poor college student who went and followed the trauma resident around all day and logged exactly what they did on each shift into several buckets. So activities were broken down into direct patient care, you know, performing surgery, putting a splint on, indirect patient care, making phone calls to other care teams, entering orders into the computer, education, either teaching other residents or at a formal lecture. And then we recorded travel time because at our residency, we're moving around to different sites uh, frequently. And so each time in each bucket was recorded and, and subcategorized. And so it's a trauma rotation we run on shifts. So it's a 12 hour shift. So 728 minutes equates to 12 hours and eight minutes. That was the average shift. Residents spend about 40% of their time in direct patient care activities. 40% of their time in indirect patient care activities, a little over 10% time uh, doing educational activities, and a little less than 10% of time in travel. So, you know, when we break this down, I, again, I was kind of floored by this concept. When you think about, okay, I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon, what am I going to do all day? What are we training our residents to do? We're training our residents to do this down here, which they do about 90 minutes a day, and which myself, I recorded my own time at the ASC, you know, it's not a lot. I do about three hours of work at our pretty high volume ASC. So, you know, 90 minutes a day may not be, you know, actually as small a number as, as you think. But you're doing that 90 minutes a day. Up there on the computer, residents are spending over three hours a day, th almost four hours, three hours and 43 minutes on the computer. An additional hour talking to people or communicating on the phone. And if you look at junior residents, they're spending almost six hours a day sitting in front of a computer. And in our residency programs and in medical school, you get almost no computer training. So, you know, this, I think, provided some pretty significant insight of, like, how do we trim the fat? So, number one, eliminate travel. I think there's, there's no sense to have residents traveling all over the place in this day and age. That, for our residency, was a, an hour of wasted time in a 12-hour day. And so, you reclaim that hour, you've got 365 hours back a year where you can have your residents actually doing something valuable to their education or valuable to the patients that you're taking care of. We've got technology now available where you can teleconference and communicate at various sites, and I think you need to leverage that. You need to try to make sure that the residents, if you can, stay at one site of service for the entire day, if possible. Obviously, if you group your lectures, another you know, problem that we had was that we had lecture every morning at the big house at 6 a.m., and then the residents had to go to their various sites, and they're driving all over the place. You know, we've now consolidated that. I think you guys were more forward in your thinking, having, you know, lectures one day a week on Monday when I was here. That prevents that, that problem. At least, you know, you're doing it one day a week at a centralized site as opposed to every single day. Um, I think it's missed, you know, the value uh, that teaching your residents computer skills can actually help improve your educational programming. So it'll actually help improve your own life. Uh, the last two years, I've been teaching myself how to program computers. Um, it's been tremendously eye-opening. So we use Epic. Uh, to meet meaningful use, I have to click mark as reviewed about 40 times uh, when I log on to the thing. And I found you know, that they have these little dictaphones that have open source software. You can program that dictaphone by hitting a button to actually go through the chart and find everywhere you need to mark as reviewed and mark as reviewed for you. And now we've got it so that it just shows up as one web page and I click one big button that has all the stuff there for me to review. I look at it and then I click the button one time and that's marked as reviewed. Uh, so I think establishing relationships for your department and for your residents with IT services and physicians who are interested in that will make your life significantly uh, improved. If you also work to help the residents with more protocol-driven care, so they spend a lot of time searching for orders in the computer, finding the right order, like, you know, I want to order four views of the knee. Well, there's like 18 orders for four views of the knee. Which one actually is going to go to, uh, you know, radiology to get the appropriate view set up? And if you keep making mistakes in that order, you keep repeating and doing more and more work. If you have protocols within your EPIC ordering system, 
the resident can kind of look at, okay, this patient needs to be admitted from a trauma expect perspective. These are the things that we need to be concerned about. Number one, it'll standardize and improve your patient care because they're not going to miss anything because they're all bucketed. And it's not going to take them six hours to enter the orders on every single patient. The other thing is note templates. Um, the residents kind of make these as they go along and they redo them every single year and every resident has their own templates. If you standardize this to your service or your group, then obviously you're gonna, again, standardize what they know or think is important, make sure that those important things show up in your note, uh, and it'll improve and enhance communication as well as decrease the amount of time that they're spending on the computer. The other big bucket is that we spend an hour on communications, uh, you know, and a lot of times the residents are calling the wrong resident or they're talking to an R2 and the R2 needs to talk to the chief and this sort of thing. That worked when we had a complete, you know, amount of time for people to talk and round and, and that sort of thing. In this era, it doesn't work as well. And I think we've all been on the other end of the phone when you've got an intern or R2 calling you or presenting to you in clinic saying, you know, I've got this guy, he's 40, he's, he's a diabetic, I think he's almost homeless. Um, you know, just, I, I really couldn't, I, I don't know, uh, you know, it, it takes them like 10 minutes to get to the point of, he's got a shoulder dislocation, these are the background issues associated with it because the other way of presenting, you have no frame of residence, they reference, they always just present history, physical assessment plan. It's not efficient. The military uses, you know, situation, background assessment and recommend. And that's what I recommend. And that's what we use in our, in our residency program. It's significantly improved communication because it standardizes it. And I've added a, a T to that to make it SBART. So the T is you give me your recommendation and then you tell me something that you want to learn based on either our communication or your experience with that patient. So if we're in the clinic, they may say, I, I don't really understand how to read a, a shoulder MRI. Can you go over that with me for a second? Or, you know, why did you do this particular thing in surgery? So it promotes, you know, a teachable moment. So instead of their presentation taking five minutes to tell me what's going on in the patient, they take two minutes to tell me what's going on with the patient. I know what I need to take care of my patient. And I then have three minutes to give back to them and teach them something that they recognize as a gap in their knowledge. So, you know, hopefully we've trimmed enough fat by doing those things to now spend some more time focusing on, on surgical skills. In order to focus on surgical skills, though, you can't just buy a $100,000 simulator and say, go up there and practice. You need to make sure that what practice they're doing is appropriate. You know, Coach always said, perfect practice makes perfect. It's not practice makes perfect. And so we got to figure out what that perfect practice is. And in order to do that, we need to have objective measures of competency for the residents. And so I've worked with several teams of very smart individuals trying to come up with ways of, of assessing this. And I'm going to go over three of the studies that, that we've done. But basically, you can assess competency for an important skill or a part of skill. We did it with knot tying. You can assess generalized competency for like an entire surgical procedure. So we use this thing called the asset score to look at ability to perform knee arthroscopy or shoulder arthroscopy. You can also look at the effectiveness of an entire curriculum. So we've looked at it at the AOS, AOSSM arthroscopic skills course for residents, you know, to actually see what is it that our residents take away, like what kind of improvement in surgical skills uh, was there. So, you know, how, how did we do this? So knot tying, incredibly basic surgical skill. This is one of those things that we teach right at the beginning of the resident course. And the residents spend about 15 minutes with it. We have the, uh, you know, attendings kind of watch them tie some knots with rope, then they tie some knots on a, on a little um, kind of a dowel, and they look at it and the attending says, yeah, I think that that's a good knot, good job. And the resident's like, sweet, I've done two knots, I'm good, I know what to do. And, you know, there's no other feedback than that. And so we wanted to really assess, okay, how are you tying the knots? Are the residents actually tying good knots? Our hypothesis was, that extremely experienced faculty. So we took the master faculty at the Anna courses. This isn't even like the uh, general faculty that just shows up to help. These are the guys that develop all of the courses and are the, the heads of all of the courses. So most of them had 20, 30 years of experience. And then we looked at a cohort of residents and we asked all of them to tie five arthroscopic knots. We used the fast uh, knot tester to stress the knots and give them immediate feedback. And then considered greater than three millimeters of elongation failure. So before we could ask the residents to tie their knots and assess it, we felt like, all right, we have to get a benchmark of faculty. So we need to have them tie their knots because we can't ask the residents to tie better knots than the faculty. So this is the way the whole thing works. Um, 
This is the equipment that you need. The knot tester is on the right, the uh, station is on the left, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in the, in, in later in the talk. You tie a knot around this um, mandrel, which is 10 millimeters in width. And, and actually, just as an aside, this whole thing was developed with significant Seattle roots. So this was an idea of me, um, Rob Petowitz, who uh, works in San Diego, but Rick Angelo had this idea. He's from Seattle. He had this idea of using a fish uh, uh, scale to kind of measure um, the uh, tension on the, on the knot. And then we worked with uh, Sawbones, which is right in Vashon Island to kind of come up with this ring sizer concept to, to assess uh, the knot. But you tie it around that 10 millimeter mandrel, you place the knot on the ring sizer over there on the fast workstation, and the first dot up there says that, you know, that knot had good um, loop security. So right there you were 10 millimeters right around that mandrel, and I can't push it down any farther. That's great. Then you stress the knot, and you put it back on the, the knot tester, this will just show, you know, you just kind of pull this thing, it'll pull the knot, and then you put it back down on the mandrel and see that that knot is stretched out more than three millimeters. So that wasn't a good knot, and that assesses your knot security. So I had good loop security on that knot, but as soon as it was under tension or stress, it essentially was a, a slip knot and loosened up. So what did we find in our, our study? So this was one of those great studies where you find something completely different than what you expect. We basically found that our faculty who had 20, 30 years of experience was not good at tying knots. So 25% of the knots in the faculty group failed. And we had guys who, you know, there, there's, there's one guy that people literally will pay, you know, $1,500 to spend four days, you know, four hours with the guy to, to learn skills from him. And all five of his knots failed. And I remember seeing him look at his result when we were talking at the table about the study afterwards. He's like, These, this isn't right. It says all five of my knots failed. He's like, I gave those knots to some kid and he put them in the wrong bag and it just isn't right. So we're like, all right, you know, you're entitled to your opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Here's the knot tester. Here's the station. Tie a knot. Let's see what you do. Tie a knot, put it on there, failed. So then he was like, well, your knot tester doesn't work. This isn't testing it right. It's just not right. Ties another knot, fails again. So now he's a little bit concerned. He tries a different type of knot and it works perfectly. And he's like, you know what? I think I'm gonna go home and start tying a different type of knot. And that just shows the value of this thing. You got somebody 35 years in practice, just changed their practice because of this simple little thing. And he, he literally spent the next like four hours of that course practicing knots and trying to, to figure it out. And we've seen this in the, in the courses now. The residents actually spend what they used to spend 15 minutes on. Now that they've got an objective measure of how they're performing, they'll spend two hours kind of perfecting how they do the knots and really looking at which ones are better. And they really understand the concept when they're done. And so our study, you know, we had residents, the Group C residents were trained to a level of proficiency. They had to tie three knots out of five without failure before they went and did their test using the knot tester, and we actually found that we were able to make those residents better than our faculty. That shows the value of, of this type of a thing. So, you know, that's assessing a skill. Now we move on to how do we assess an actual procedure. So to do this, um, you know, it, it gives us a lot of uh, opportunity. You can assess the competency of residents or surgeons. You can assess the ability of various simulators to actually teach a skill. So you can figure out like, if I do the simulator at PGY1, is it better than if we do it at PGY3? If I use company X's simulator, is it better than company Y's? You can assess your entire curricula with it. In order for this to work, it's gotta be a valid measure of surgical skill. It has to be reliable. So the problem with most of these systems that have been out there is that there's not real good intra and intra observer reliability, test retest uh, reliability, and optimally, the tool that you use, you want it to be able to assess the transfer skills from the lab to the OR. So you need to be able to use the tool in both environments. If it only works in the OR, then you don't know, you know, kind of the advancement of skills in the, in the lab. So um, I got a group of experts uh, in arthroscopy together. There's about 25 of us, series of conference calls doing uh, this Delphi method coming up with this arthroscopic surgical skill evaluation tool. So this is a generalized tool, not specific to any particular procedure, but it's looking at those things that we think are important in arthroscopy. So you break things down into eight domains, and then people are graded on a Likert scale with weighted descriptors from, from one to five. 
And so we did some pretty extensive validation uh, with this asset tool. So we saw that it did have good construct validity. If you look at the graph on the left, you know, essentially as you went up through your year in training, you were significantly better on the asset than the folks who were more junior to you. If you looked at case logs, obviously, you know, your score improved based on how many cases they had logged. And kind of the, the score of about 50 cases to relative level of competency um, kind of uh, stuck. And if you actually look back in some of the older literature, when they were asking people to estimate how many folk or how many cases did it take for people to be competent at diagnostic knee arthroscopy, the estimate from the program directors was about 50 cases. So this lends a little bit of construct validity to it. We looked at reliability, it was highly reliable. So, you know, inter-observer reliability for the whole instrument was above 0.8, which is, you know, very good. And these were basically blinded raters assessing video of people doing the procedure. So we didn't know who the residents were, you knew nothing, you just saw the intra-articular portion of the case Anybody can do this. We've done this between institutions. So I've worked with some of the military guys. They'll send me um, video of their residents performing procedure and I'll grade it. I'll send them video of my residents um, completely blind and that was allowing us to, to test it. We've also shown that you don't need a whole lot of rater training to achieve this level of uh, reliability. Um, we validated it for use as a pass-fail test. So one way that we like to use it in our program is it's a go-no-go. -go. So you go to the lab and you practice and we give you a score and if you achieve competent on every level then you know you're good to be going to the OR if you don't you need to be spending more time uh, practicing It's been validated for the shoulder and the knee and in the lab and in the in the OR so you know now we've got tools to identify subsets of skills we've got tools to identify more complex skills and you know the holy grail is kind of putting it all together and evaluating a curriculum so we tried to test this out at the uh, aos fundamentals of knee and shoulder arthroscopy course so this is a course dedicated to improving the skills of residents um, they spend three days working with one faculty member two residents two cadavers um, it's it's expensive and subsidized by the uh, academy and so their goal was to say all right well we want to prove that this is effective because we're spending a lot of money on this on this course and the only thing they used to have was just feedback so you get the little feedback form and the residents would say you know this course is as effective as a six-week rotation we love it but it's nothing that's objective so at last year's course we had 46 residents 23 attendings each participant performed a diagnostic knee arthroscopy on a cadaver at the beginning of the course right when they got there and they performed another one at the end of the knee day and then they also performed an arthroscopy on the virtual reality simulator at the beginning of the course and at the end of the knee day. And we assessed the outcomes of the asset score. We assessed metrics on the arthroscopic simulator and we also assessed resident confidence. And so this is what we found. So we found significant improvement in the asset score. We found significant improvement in confidence and pretty much all of the metrics obtained on the virtual reality simulator, which are completely objective um, showed uh, significance in terms of uh, improvement. Next step is obviously assessing and understanding what the clinical significance of this is. So we're, you know, calculating transfer effectiveness ratios now to say, you know, 10% improvement is equivalent to how many weeks of training in your arthroscopic uh, uh, residency uh, program. The one thing that I'll say that we found that was very interesting to this was the course has residents practice arthroscopy on cadaver knees. And when we grade them on the cadaver, you know, they can get a relatively good grade with the asset. Uh, the cadaver doesn't allow you to flex or extend the knee very much and it's hard to apply valgus. When they went to the simulator, because the residents were practicing on cadaver knees, 50 to 60 percent of them completely forgot to put the leg on their hip and apply varus or valgus stress. They just left it at 90 degrees, just like the cadaver. And so it just goes back to the fact that perfect practice makes perfect. And you've got to be having, you know, your, your simulation, you know, you need to make sure that they're understanding all concepts or facets of the case to make it valuable. So again, resident hands-on surgical experience is a valuable commodity. We need to assess what we're doing. And, you know, once we know that simulation is possible or effective and necessary, we need to figure out how do we incorporate it in a residency program and how can we make sure that the time that they're spent doing simulation is actually valuable and uh, successful. And so that's kind of the next phase of research that I've been going into. So we looked at first to understand 
you know, how we can make an ideal curriculum, we wanted to look at what is the curriculum that most programs are using. We sent out a big questionnaire to all program directors. We got about 26% to respond. We sent it out to all residents and we assessed what type of training do you employ in arthroscopy? What's the perceived effectiveness of that training? And then we assess the confidence of the residents at each of the programs. So this graph basically shows kind of what we call traditional techniques, which is you know, observing and assisting in surgery, reading published material, reading technique guides. Those are all to the right. And then kind of less traditional techniques are on the left, uh, performing simulated surgery on dry models, cadavers, using virtual reality, accessing information on the web, or going to hands-on courses. And so you can see you know, all residency programs do observing and assisting. 70% have some sort of cadaveric experience. 60% have dry models. VR was very limited at the time of uh, this uh, questionnaire, and I think probably has been increasing uh, some. And I think the web-based training has definitely been increasing. So when you look at perceived effectiveness um, to assess the value that residents and program directors put on types of training, you can see that the most value went right to assisting in surgery. The second most value, though, of the you know, simulated techniques was cadaveric training. Third most was the course. It was interesting that the only thing that students and teachers, residents and faculty differed on was observation. Faculty thought that there was much more value obtained from observing in the OR. Residents felt that there was less value to that. And I think that the reason for that is, is that we as faculty generate a lot of value from observing in the OR. When I go watch, you know, expert faculty, you know, do a surgery, I learn a tremendous amount because I've been in the OR, I've struggled with that case, I've had problems, and I know how hard it is. And then I watch, you know, Dave Bray do it, and I'm like, my God, that guy's a genius. And you learn a lot from that experience. As a resident, you might not learn as much from that experience because you do not have the frame of reference of how difficult it actually is or what they're, what they're doing. And so, you know, that observation, especially for an R1 or an R2, may not be as valuable other than to learn the steps of the procedure. And there's other ways that you can actually teach that uh, outside of the OR. If you look at confidence, you know, so the programs that had cadaveric training, we wanted to look at how confident were they in performing arthroscopic procedures. The programs that had cadaveric training, the residents all were more confident in performing arthroscopy than the programs that did not have cadaveric training. So the question I always get asked is, all right, you know, you're very interested in simulation. Well, what's the, what's the ideal simulator? What should we buy? What should we employ? Um, so I, I, in general, I'm going to answer this first, and I'm going to actually talk about what's more important than that question, because I don't think this is the most important question. But an ideal simulator really needs to be low cost so that every program can have it. Uh, residents need to have easy access to it, so it needs to be somewhere where they are so that they can go get it, or it needs to be something that they can take home and use. It has to be of sufficient fidelity to teach the skill that you're trying to get them to acquire. It needs to be validated. It needs to allow for self-directed deliberate practice. So you need that repetition over and over and over again, just like going to the driving range to perfect a golf swing. Uh, and then it needs to be able to provide objective feedback right there to the resident, like that knot tester. You, you immediately see whether your knot fails or not, and then you go do another one. Uh, I think that's, that's the ideal simulator. But the real answer to this is it has to start with curriculum. And so in orthopedics, we've been designing these things completely backwards. What happens is industry develops this awesome simulator or this new technology comes out, and we're like, great, that's sweet. How can we apply that to our residency program? as opposed to we need to teach residents this because we've identified gaps in their knowledge or their skill, which then says we need to have an educational experience surrounding to, to fill that gap. Uh, and then you develop a curriculum, and then whatever simulator you use needs to teach and be validated for that curriculum. And I think we've been doing this backwards for a long time. Uh, ABOS recognized this recently and had us kind of come up with more standardized curriculums. I was fortunate enough to be a part of uh, that for the arthroscopy portion of the, the curriculum and learned a tremendous amount about, you know, how to do this correctly. And, and um, you know, I think it was a, a significant move in the right direction. So um, in partnership with uh, Arthroscopy Association of North America, ABOS, and the Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, we came up with this Fundamentals of Arthroscopic Surgery Training Program, which is uh, a curriculum. And then as part of that curriculum, we wanted to come up with the simulator to allow people to kind of train as part of that, that curriculum. And the FAST group had started, you know, while I was still in residency here, 
Uh, and after, when I became a fellow and an early attending, I had kind of been interested in this myself. And so this is something that me and a medical student essentially made in my garage out of a bunch of Home Depot equipment. Um, it's a box trainer for orthopedics. Requires a computer, requires a light source. You can see that it's modular, so that little thing in the middle there is a Tupperware container. Um, it's black around the outside. We put Velcro in the middle of it. We use some little two by fours. We put the modules in there. So if you look back at this, these are different modules. So there's a probing module. There's a little meniscectomy ACL type module. There's a knot tying. There's some ring transfer modules. We would put them into that black box and then we'd have them use a, you know, these endoscopes that people use for designing microchips. You know, they put a, an endoscope there and it'll hold and you can actually see on your computer screen. It works almost like a scope on a camera. It doesn't have the 30 degree angle, but it costs 60 bucks and you can just practice at home with this little endoscope. And so we thought that this was a really good concept. And then as, as an attending, I, I got in touch and I presented this at, at a meeting and the guys working on FAST kind of approached me and said, hey, we're trying to do a similar thing. Do you want to come present to us? And that essentially turned into the FAST workstation. You'll see a lot of similarities between what we did in my garage with what you know, was eventually made and used as the simulator. So, you know, it's a, uh, a modular platform. So there's just a platform or suction cups. You put it on the table uh, and that allows you first to practice on the module with no constraints. You can look right at it visually. You can kind of get those basic skills and the concepts of the procedure right away. Then you can put a clear dome on it so you can still look at what you're doing, but you're constrained by different portals to, to doing your procedure and you can kind of work out those strategies in your head. And then last, you put the opaque dome on where you can't see, and then you've got to get those more complex skills going where you, know, you have to understand that you know, you're operating in 3D space and you're looking at a 2D, 2D image on the, on the computer screen. And so it's modular, just like the thing we set up in the garage. These are the different modules that are available for it. They basically snap in, uh, and we have instructions for, for all of those. Um, the way we developed the modules was we kind of broke down arthroscopic skills, or the way we developed the curriculum was we broke down arthroscopic skills into their most basic components. And I'm going to show the things we do for, for visualization, because in arthroscopy, if you can't see, you can't fix your patient, you can't operate. You need to understand how, how to see and how the arthroscope works. And so, you know, there's several concepts. So one is you need to control the horizon. You need to understand horizontal motion and how you rotate the arthroscope. You need to be able to track an object in space, so you need to be able to do linear scope motion. And then you need to understand how telescoping works. So if you push the arthroscope in or you pull it out, it works just like a telescope. Your visual field becomes much more up close. You're going to see those things in, in you know, it's going to fill your, your whole visual field. If you telescope in, if you pull back, you're going to have a wider field of view. And then you need to understand periscoping, which is there's a 30 degree angle on the scope. You have the little light source. As you scoop that around, it's just like a periscope on a submarine. You're going to be able to look around corners and affect your visual field. And so we wanted to develop some ways that people could practice this. And so this is you know, kind of our setup for the visualization modules. Um, these are the first time I'm kind of showing these. These are going to be available online pretty soon at the ABOS and ANA website and the Sawbones website to show people actually how to use the workstations that uh, folks are, are starting to uh, to employ, but this is kind of a quick example of how we train, you know, that horizon control. So you can see it doesn't show up real well over here, but there's a little hash, uh, and we're trying to get the lines of the different colors. So the first task is get the blue line with the horizon, get the green line with the horizon, get the black line with the horizon. See how your hand is oriented and how your scope is moving, and we have benchmarks that they have to achieve. Now we've got this little hash, and they've got to track that linear motion across. So they need to keep that line within that hash without going up or down. Pretty easy when you're going left to right. You'll see in a second as we move on with this that you can then rotate the scope a little bit, which is equivalent to operating in the lateral compartment of the knee. And with the scope uh, rotated off axis, it becomes a lot more difficult uh, to do this. And it's an important skill that residents kind of can perfect in technique. It's almost like training your brain to understand, okay, if my scope is rotated this way, that means my hand needs to move, you know, in this uh, direction. So that's showing this. So now we've got the scope kind of rotated completely 90 degrees, which means in order to actually do this, which looks the same on the screen, I'm now moving my hand up and down as opposed to before I was moving my hand side to side. We have benchmarks that they need to, to achieve and, and get to with that.
Um, the next task that we do is focusing on image centering, so telescoping and, and periscoping. So we've got you know, the residents kind of understanding how the periscoping works, and their goal here is to get the black dot to fill the whole field of view with a little bit of blue around it, but not see any red. Once they're at that point, they can move to the next one. And these things are positioned to the left and to the right of the scope, so you have to periscope in order to actually get that thing centered. It constrains what you can do. You can't do this just by pushing the scope in and out. It works on some of the mental gymnastics that have to occur in arthroscopy to establish uh, good visualization. So those are very deconstructed skills. And then we have this other core set of skills that are more complex tasks. So they incorporate telescoping, periscoping, horizontal uh, visual tracking. So this is the probing module. So here you've got to visualize by telescoping, periscoping, moving around the numbers. We have a random number generator that basically calls out the numbers that you have to probe. And you probe 10 numbers in sequence. And you need to do that within a certain time with no errors in order to establish or achieve the benchmark. So people, this is kind of like a top line screen. So I'll actually have older residents, when they come out of the rotation, they'll just do this. If you're good at doing this, you don't really need to do the other modules of periscoping and horizontal linear motion and things like that. If you're good at the combined task, you're going to be good at the individual tasks. At least that's my hypothesis. We're testing that right now with a study. But that's currently the way that, that, uh, that we're using it. So um, if you guys are interested in this, the basic skills modules are on the ANA website and on the ABOS website. You can go there. Um, we will soon, you know, I, I just spent a couple of days recording and editing video for pretty much all of the modules to really describe in detail how these things work. I have the rough copies here that I'm going to give to, to Trey uh, so that you guys can have them start using them with your simulator while we're here. Um, what we're doing now is validating that FAST curriculum. We're trying to quantify, like I said before, you know, what is the benefit of doing it? When is it best to employ it? Um, we're creating those easy to understand instructions as well as the benchmarks. So uh, the benefit, I, I'm, I uh, am a faculty now for uh, the ANA courses um, and actually am developing the curriculum for all of those courses. Uh, and as part of that, I've been able to employ this. And so we're able to actually have the faculty do these tasks to establish our benchmarks. And that's the study we're conducting uh, right now. Uh, it's been employed at the ANA and AOS courses. Um, definitely provides a good template for other specialties. So even if your specialty is not arthroscopy, you can see how we're doing this sort of thing and come up with modules. And, you know, there's people within my program who've gotten excited about some of this basically from seeing what we're doing. This is also interesting. This is one of the virtual reality companies. Um, they thought this was a cool concept. They put it right on their virtual reality trainer. The neat thing about that for me from a research perspective is it now just opens up a whole bunch more data that I can actually collect on people. So instead of recording time and accuracy, I can use the simulator to tell me how smooth they were, how complete the actual procedure or task was, how much motion, you know, did they have economy of motion? Were they really slick while they were doing it? It just gives me a lot more information uh, for developing our, our curriculums. So uh, in conclusion, basically, I think going forward in this kind of new era of medical education, we really need to have three main goals to focus on. We need to try to achieve and maintain an appropriate balance of education and service. Uh, service is still important, and, and what highlighted that to me is, you know, residency is not just all about education. I actually had a meeting with uh, one of the, the senators about um, uh, education, and one of the first things that, that came up to him was, why do we pay residents? You know, you're, you're educating them. It's just another form of education. They should be paying for this themselves. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, that's completely the, the wrong way to go. We pay residents because they do work. And so, you know, part of the job is definitely work. The ideal thing is make sure that the work is valuable and that the work is efficient so that you can also educate. I mean, think about the debt you would have uh, if you tacked on five years of residency. Um, we need to longitudinally assess competency, like I said, objectively. We need to, you know, kind of understand what we're doing and work to perfect it. And then leverage technology to augment our existing educational opportunities. And so I, I would call this the judicious use of simulation. You don't want to just buy the latest and greatest. You want to make sure that you're buying, you know, the thing that is going to help you achieve your goal, which is more efficient, more competent, 
residents when they end their residency. So um, thank you guys very much. I, I left uh, my email up there, always looking for collaborators, uh, people to help me with this stuff, other people interested in education. Certainly feel free to contact me. We're always looking for more sites to do, you know, more, you know, more random trials and, and things like that. Shock and awe, no questions? <laughs> Ted? Greg, it's great to have you back. I have a, sort of the other side of the question. Do you think you can decide who isn't competent to be an orthopedic surgeon? And when might you do something about it? So I think that that's a dangerous question. Um, I think that uh, the answer is that we probably can identify those who may be struggling earlier on in their careers. You may be able to use this stuff to identify who might be a good resident, but I would say we've been trying to do that for years and years and years with other techniques, and nobody's been able to do it. It's just like the NFL Combine. I mean, they put these athletes through this complete meat market test to determine who's going to be the best football player, and they don't get it right. You know, 20% of the time they may be hit on it. The majority of those quarterbacks drafted in the first round flunk out. So that same, you know, concept is probably going to apply with residents. But what you can do is there is, you do identify with this because we have our residents start doing it as interns and twos. You identify those who are having struggles with technical skills and you can kind of come up with uh, programs to help them progress and if they're not you can have that meeting about hey listen you're lagging way behind your peers this may not be the thing that's right for you are you sure you want to commit to another three years of this or do you maybe want to start thinking about another career path and we've actually had three residents choose other career paths in the last three years uh, from from our program due to a multitude of, of different reasons unfortunately that's been happening at like the R4 year when they need to get letters for their fellowships, the people who need to write those letters are saying, you know what, I don't feel comfortable writing you a letter to my friends because I just don't think you're competent. And then they're running into a big problem. And so this hopefully is going to help us identify those folks early on, have those important discussions early on. And I think with this practice, I mean, there's nothing, you got, you know, 26, 27, 28 year old, incredibly smart individuals who are doing this. The majority of people you can teach to do this stuff to a level of competency. You, you may need to, you know, change goals and expectations. You may not be producing somebody who's going to be the best general surgeon in the world, but you can probably find out a niche that they can fit into and use their knowledge and skills and their passion for orthopedics. You just have to put them in the right position to succeed, and this will identify how we can help those folks succeed. Greg, my question for you is, you know, the residents are immediately enthusiastic and involved in this, I imagine. How long did it take you to get your faculty to buy into this? Uh, six years. Okay. So as long as I've been there, and I would say not everybody is still bought in. Um, I think having the opportunity to do presentations like this and showing people the research and the numbers, that's what changes practice. So, you know, we started out with, I got there and Regis was good enough to kind of find funding for a lab and we started running labs i came up with a way to make that self-funding and we were able to do one lab a month uh, and then faculty started seeing benefit from it residents started seeing benefit from it talking about it and just this year we're now going ahead with a 46-week curriculum starting in july for our younger residents where we have the chief residents a couple of them coming back to teach and we've got the younger residents learning up there every week. So it's, it's not full protected time for the whole residency, but it's semi-protected time for a group of individuals that are going to go through the curriculum. And it's every Thursday. Uh, I teach it from 3 to 6 p.m. Great. And thank you, and thank you for doing this for us and, and coming back to the home. And just as a reminder, there's a skills test tonight from 6 to 9 in the ISIS lab on the third floor. Yeah, I would faculty say. and residents are invited. 
Yeah. It's not a test. Yeah, I would say it's, it's fun. Yeah, I would say that this is not yeah, this is not a test in any way. It's a skills uh, challenge. We called it the uh, orthopedic festivus were at, at our program. So we basically, you know, uh, do feats of strength, which are the orthopedic skills, and then we go out for beers afterwards and have the earring of grievances. We even had a little festivus poll. Um, it's cool, it works if the faculty shows up. So the residents like nothing more than to see if they can put a you know 110 fully threaded uh, you know cortical screw in just as fast as you know Dr. Dunbar, their faculty that they really you know revere, or you know if their hand surgeons really do you know hit the goal on the closest to the pin test. It's it's just it's a good time. Hopefully you guys will will enjoy it, and maybe it'll be something you start here. Well, thanks for coming. This was really informative. Do you? Outside of your special sessions that you have, do you, Greg, have you set up a, a lab that the residents can go to before a case when they have some time to practice skills that isn't supervised? Yes. So, so I think, you know, going back to that ideal simulator, the simulator needs to in some way be the teacher as well as the platform for practice and the evaluator. Because faculty time, as you know, is a premium and there is different buy-in from the different faculty. And so... If you can have the simulator do all that, it's much more valuable to the residents. It needs to be in a location where they have easy access to. So we have a, we have a virtual reality simulator at our um, home lab now that we just got. Um, that was one of the things our new chairman, uh, I was able to have him ask for and they supported. Um, we have the fast stations up there so residents can call up and do knot tying. The issue is like at the ASC, there's no downtime. So it's there. Um, they can come in before, they can stay afterwards and use it, but with a 15 minute turnover, they don't have the time to practice those things. So, you know, I remember sitting and tying knots around like, a, you know, anything that I could find when I was a resident because I had an hour in between cases trying to figure out how to perfect that. We just don't have that anymore. So I think the key is trying to find that time within the program and actually building it in and getting the faculty to buy in and say, you know what, this is valuable for my residents. And, you know, I'm going to do some easy cases where I can operate with myself or with a PA while they're actually doing this. And they'll find that when the residents come back, they're much more uh, successful at, at what they're doing. And it's actually a better experience for the faculty in the OR when your residents are more competent. You're not worried that somebody's going to puncture an artery, your blood pressure is not as high. You know they've achieved a certain level of competence and it's, it's actually a good feeling. All right. Thank you, guys.